Amen. Woo! Well, there's two stools up here. One is for me, and the other one is for our long-awaited pastor, friend, brother, Carl Gully is going to be with us today. Oh, they're already coming. <laughs> now, I want to say, hey, yeah, come on. Obviously, the welcome is already there, but you guys stole my thunder. I asked Carl, I said, hey, how much did you weigh when you left? And he said, I was 5'10", 195. He said, I'm coming back at 5'9 half, 180. Just wanted y'all to know that. <laughs> That's how I wanted to introduce him, but you guys beat the thunder. You were loved, my friend. That's good accountability when they start talking about how much you weigh at church. You're like, better yeah. keep, stay on that bike. <laughs> keep, keep hammering it out. So. You were loved. I feel the love. Feel good. Very overwhelmed. Well, Thank here we you. are. We're here in the big house. You're yeah. back after a year sabbatical. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Whoever said that. Thank you. And uh, so, Thank what's you. it like? What's it like seeing folks that you know and don't know? It's it's over, it's overwhelming. Honestly, I, you know, I'm typically a very extroverted person, but I've been more on the introverted world this last uh, little bit. So to walk in this place and see so many faces. Uh, I was reminded this week that June 6th, 1999 was when we planted this church. Yeah. So this week is our 23-year, we're, we're 23 years old. Anniversary, guys. 23 and, anniversary, uh, yes. And some of you guys were there at the Heart of Texas Fairgrounds. We, we, we were there. We were there. And, uh, uh, and so I see some of those faces that I look around and just like we've been together. And then it's also wild to be gone for a year. You, you miss so many things about it, but then you also see pe people, you know, and they're, they're like, we've been here nine months. We have no idea who that guy is. They're like, who are we clapping for? <laughs> you know, uh, you know I, I, I told Jimmy that I had a little fender bender near Waterburger, kind of bumped into a lady, and I got out like, oh, I'm so sorry. And so you kind of bumped and, into uh, a lady? Or you I, did I, kind of, in? I bumped into her, but okay. it was All just, right. okay. it, was a, it was a little bump. It was just like, it's sorry, everything okay? Yeah, okay. And she, <laughs> she saw us wearing an Antioch hat, and uh, she's like, Antioch? do you go to Antioch? And I was like, I do. I do go there. I do. And, uh, and she said, we've been going there about four months and God is just changing our lives and we just love this church. And uh, she's like, but I've never seen you there. You know, I was like, no, you haven't, but are you going this week? And she said, yeah. I was like, we're going to show a little video of me. I'm actually one of the guys on staff. She's like, well, that's great. Maybe I'll see you around. You know, so it's weird seeing new faces and so exciting to see new faces. And uh, so, and, and just miss this family a lot over the last year and thankful for the support this tribe has given me. Man. Well, um, some people have seen you around town. There have been some sightings. Mm -hmm. Carl, they usually report to me where they've seen you. Um, so where have you been the last year? Where'd you hub out of? Uh, yeah, I, where have you resurfaced? I went all over the, the nation, honestly. I mean, um, I really, I mean, I literally started off in, um, in Montana, and oh, I see the McFarlings over there. My buddy Brent hooked me up with a fly rod so I could go fly fishing. Uh, it was in Oklahoma and Missouri and Tennessee and Spent a lot of time in California with this ministry I was learning from, so I literally went all over, but I really just hubbed out of Waco, and, and I am, I've been in Waco since the birth. Like, I know a lot of y'all, y'all joined because Baylor's cool or Magnolia's cool, but some of us are like, Waco, Waco. Hey, you know, we've been around. Waco was cool before it was cool it, it, we, to us. Yeah, to uh, us, but yes. not to everybody else. Waco, Waco, and so it's kind of hard to go anywhere without me seeing 25 of my best friends, so I basically just tried to stay incognito. I wore a mask a lot. So people, I would see them, but they wouldn't always see me. And I kind of just went down low. But um, I, mean, I really did not see hardly anybody except the guy that cuts my, Jesse Cruz is my best friend who cut my hair. Other than that, I, I didn't see hardly anyone. Can I interrupt you? I Please said, do. I said, so Carl, uh, you cook on Sunday afternoons for your extended family. Yes, I do. It was a part of your activity. You'll uh -huh. talk about that in a minute. But yeah. um, I would say, hey, Carl, who's at H-E-B on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Yeah. in Woodway? He said, well, a lot of our church members are out there. So if you're online or Carl saw you, I got your name. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I did learn to go to the grocery store about 9 a.m. I, I wouldn't see anybody that I knew. And, uh, oh, and, uh, and there was obviously someone that I knew. And actually, a couple of times, a lady would stop me and say, I've been praying for you, and I've got a word for you in aisle nine. And so that was sweet, too. Um, and honestly, I just flew under the radar. 
um, until Baylor basketball season started. And I literally went to every game because I don't have a job, you know? So I went to every game with my wife and my dad. And, uh, and even then I could fly into the radar for the most part. But then I saw Scott Drew in town and he was like, hey dude, come sit behind the, the team. And so we, <laughs> we sat behind the team and it was, we were playing Texas Tech and we got down and it was like 40 seconds left and we're down by six or something like that. And it was the ESPN game of the week, and they did this, like, came right in on me, and I was like, you know, in my prayer position, and I, uh, and I got, uh, I got bust, and all of a sudden, my phone, my phone was like, and I got a sabbatical phone. Most people have my number, and I was like, but everybody who did was getting, was reaching out, and and most people, they were like, okay, we've finally seen you after like six months. And the other people were like, and your hair is so much grayer than it was when you left. <laughs> and uh, I was like, I promise it's not that gray. It's the lighting. There's a lot in there. But uh, so after that, people started seeing me more. And then, I, and then I went to the Big 12 Championship and everybody saw me there again talking to Everyday John. So other than that, I flew in, I flew into the radar. Other than but being then, ESPN. But other than being yeah. the ESPN, I, went, I mean, when, when I went back and watched it, you could hear the announcer said, and they're praying in Waco, Texas for the Bears to come back. And I was, but it did not work. work. So yeah. I don't know that I'll ever get invited to sit behind the team ever again, but it was an honor to get to go when I did. So, Well, uh, speaking about church and all that good stuff, mm -hmm. um, I've known you since you were 13 years old. Yep. Uh, your mom made you go to church every time the doors were open. That's right. I remember her coming to uh, me and Sean Richmond yeah. when you were a kid and saying, you have to decide my son. Yeah. Kevin it wasn't, a, I wasn't an option. It was a declaration. <laughs> sure, she'd been praying into it for years. Uh, but we've known each other for 34 years, and we've done a lot of church. Uh, but, um, but I heard you were skipping church a little <laughs> bit during your sabbatical. I did. Um, I, I, when I get to heaven, I think my mom's probably got some words for me about that. <laughs> but uh, when I grew up, if you didn't have like your right arm in your hands, you, you were not allowed to skip church, you know, you were there. And so, but yeah, you know, in sabbatical, it's unusual when you lead church, then you, it's hard to just kind of pipe into the stream. You, you kind of see it differently. So at first, and so actually I just and kind of pulled back and would just kind of rest in the mornings, but I had a baseball coach friend of mine who said every off season, he learns one thing that is not baseball related and challenged me to do the okay. same. So I said, well, I'm great at burning whatever I grill, so maybe I'll just learn to grill stuff, you know? And so went online, literally was like, how to barbecue? And this group called Meat Church came Meat, up, M-E-A-T M -E -A -T Church. And okay. so I love Meat Church. And so <laughs> I love that. So anyway, literally- Where do they gather? They're in, well, they don't gather. Basically, okay. we are the congregation. Oh. <laughs> we, we, uh, we are the church, Jimmy. Okay. And so yes. yeah, anyway, so it's in Waxahachie. I literally watched everything they did, and then I would grill for my extended family every Sunday. They're probably ticked off. I think we're having Chipotle today. So it's the first Sunday in a year that they're having to like eat a restaurant and not a, hey. not something I've done. To the rest but, of our world. but, you know, honestly, I did get to go to some churches. I went to go see three or four of our Antioch churches in the, in the nation. Went to um, different churches that I've not, I've always wanted to go to, but I didn't get a, a chance to experience things different than our own uh, stream. So like Anglican Church, Episcopalian Church, went to a Jewish synagogue, just got a, a lot of different experiences. But I told our staff that I had one of the most wild and crazy church experiences, and I've done some church you in my life. But um, I've always in my guts wanted to go visit a cowboy church. Anybody here ever been to a cowboy church? Yeah. Well, I've always had this sense that these are my people mm. and I need to be with these people, but I'm really just a wannabe cowboy at heart. I'm really, I mean, I see the cowboy hat on my friend over there. I, I, I could put it on, but you would pretty much know city boy, we see you, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and so in life groups, sometimes I'll be, what's your walk-up song? If you had a walk-up song and I'm always like, Man, should have been a cowboy. Should have learned to rope and ride. That's my song. <laughs> so I'm going to go to cowboy church. And so I put on my Wranglers. I put on my boots, my Ariat shirt. And I walk in and I'm like, I'm here, you know, and uh, howdy. And so I'm trying to <laughs> fit right in. And they were the nicest salt of the earth people, just welcomed me. And they, they could tell that I, was, that I am not a cowboy. And so, but they were just so amazing, and I, I thought it was interesting when we started singing, singing worship. Nobody stood up. We just kind of were listening, and I'm, I'm trying to follow. I, I just, it wasn't songs that it seemed like you could sing. They weren't really like to God, or it was just about great things in life. I had, I had wondered, like, do you sing Garth Brooks songs at Cowboy Church, you know? So I brushed up on my friends in low places, and I was, I was ready to go there. But 
I couldn't follow along, but it was beautiful, beautiful. And so we, but the lady stops, put her banjo down for a second, says, well, I sent out a little program. You should have gotten it when you walked in. It's the list of 10 people to pray for in our, in our, in our church. And I forgot James. He's got a major procedure this week. Big deal, guys. So we all commit to praying for, for James. Hey, James, I sure am sorry that I, that I left you off. And he's like, it's all right. And so <laughs> she goes back into singing this song. And again, I'm like, it's about a carpenter and some moons and stars. And I'm trying to follow it, but I just didn't. I'm just like. And so she gets done and she, she gets done. She puts that banjo down. She goes. Hey, church, I was watching y'all. Y'all were not singing and clapping with me that last song. And she's like, so we're going to do it again, and I need y'all singing and clapping. And James, I need you moving. Let's just be honest. The reason you're having that procedure is because you put on a few pounds, and you need to lose a few pounds. And so let's get to moving. I am not making this up. This is, and I am in charge of services a lot, and so, I mean, I start having panic attacks. Like, I'm like, I'm in charge of James and her, and you know, I was just like, this is not my church. Let them all. But, you know, they were all like, that's true, James. He's like, it is, you know, and they just... And the pastor came up to me afterwards. He's like, you ought to just come here every week for your sabbatical. And I was, I was a little heavier at that point. I was like, I don't think so. I got, I got, let me go work this off. I'll see you guys when I lose a few pounds, you know. And, uh, but they were so sweet. They, were, they invited me to team roping and all kinds of Bible studies. And, but uh, uh, I, I didn't get to go back. But I, my people. <laughs> But one day they'll be my people. In your mind. In my mind, they yes. will be my people. Uh, <laughs> that's, I wish we had that video. Just oh, I, yes. it was, gosh, it was an experience. Yes. So um, we talk about sabbatical, not, maybe not a common theme, thing for most people. Mm-hmm. Um, tell us a little bit about what it is, okay? Mm-hmm. And then what did God teach you in that journey? Because, of course, yeah. Sabbath, we are familiar with that yeah. word. Mm-hmm. But what does it mean to take an extended break? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think that it, 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 it's really interesting. The idea of sab- sabbatical is kind of catching on, even for professors to go on extended breaks. And I'm hearing business leaders are taking sabbaticals. It's becoming a word, but it's not been something that we've done a lot of. And if I'm really honest, I think I had kind of an, a warped idea of what it was. Uh, like, I either go away and write a book or... Or I kind of thought, this is something that we reward people with. Like, you've sacrificed a lot. You get a sabbatical. Or it's something we give people like, you're really messed up, so we'd like you to take a sabbatical, you know? <laughs> and I'm not saying that both of those couldn't have been true to a degree. But, <laughs> but I think that my, uh, I was talking to my counselor about this, and um, I just want to say thank you to all the counselors. We need more counselors, and um, I, I hope everybody, I've been, I've been so blessed by my counselor and my spiritual director and our leadership coach that I have, and I was like, gosh, I should have been doing this the last 10 years, but... But um, and he, when he shared with me that the idea of taking an extended break, at first I was like, oh, man, am I that messed up? And he was like, why are you asking that? And I'm like, well, I don't, I don't know why I'd go away that long. And he said, I, I think you've got a really, it's, it's not that you're messed up. You have a, a messed up view of what Sabbath is and sabbatical really is. And what God wants to do is take you away from this, go to war, get out, go to war, get out, because you could be taking the battle with you everywhere you go. He wants to give you a Sabbath heart. And I think in the Western culture specifically, we kind of think we can all run at Mach 3 right. and then go away for seven days with our four small kids, get refreshed, and then come back, and then we're ready to go. Yes. And, um, and I, see, I see you, uh, my cowboy yeah, friend. I resemble that. Uh, I saw that, amen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think that uh, I, I'm not saying, I know that sabbat- a long ex- sabbatical is not reality for 99% of people. That's why I'm very overwhelmed that this church would support me and that you and Laura and the elders would come behind me and support me in this time. And we do give sabbaticals to different leaders in our midst, but, but I just think that I'm believing for creative options for us as a people because our, we're actually not supposed to be a part of a Western culture or an Eastern culture. We're supposed to be a part of a kingdom culture. Yeah, and on. that kingdom culture has something much deeper for all of us. And so it doesn't mean that sabbatical is always easy. It's not like, oh, wow, you got to do everything you want to do for 12 months. It's not easy, but yeah. it's, a, it's something I believe that we need to get to so we can get to the heart. So when you talk about getting to the heart, of course, mm-hmm. um, God spoke to you some mm-hmm. Different things that are life lessons, right? Yeah. Life changing for yeah. you. Mm-hmm. Uh, take us through a little bit of that. What has what God been speaking to you, doing in you, and therefore obviously doing through you? Well, like I said, I, everywhere I'd go, people would stop me and say, uh, if, I, if, I, if I saw someone, they'd, they'd be like, man, so excited you're on a break, but I would hate that. You know, like, is that, is that hard for you? Um, you know, or I'd have people say, I'd be going crazy if I, if I had to go through that same thing. And uh, 
one of my, <laughs> one of my buddies, he said, uh, I don't know what I'd do with myself. Like I would either just go work out all the time and be the most jacked, rip individual in the world, or I might just become an alcoholic, you know? <laughs> and I said, I, I, feel, I feel what you're saying, because the, the thing is, um, it, it is, there are beautiful blessings to a sabbatical, and if you do it right, there's actually some challenges that you'll face along the way. The blessing part is you get the time to rest, reflect, got to really go deep with my family, and Blair and I celebrate 24 years tomorrow, and so we'll be, and uh, spend a lot of time with our family and our kids, and got to really have some experiences that, we'll, that I'll talk about for the rest of my life, a, a well I'll drink from for the rest of my life, so I'm grateful for that, but at the same time, it, it can get hard, if I'm really honest, because um, the first day I went out to my friends at Socorro's place, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to spend time with God for a long time, I'm going to read, I'm going to work out, I'm going to rest, take a nap, and I got done with all of that, and it was noon. <laughs> and I was like, oh, shoot, I've got six months of this, what am I going to do? I'm, or and then it turned into longer, and so, you know, uh, I said I turned into an introvert on this break, and... Most introverts really treasure the time they get to have by themselves. But what I learned about a sabbatical is it's not, it's not do you want to go be by yourself, it's do you actually know how to slow down enough to be with yourself? Mm. And, if, and really be okay, I'm with God, I'm with myself, and that's about it. A few close friends along the way. And so, um, you know, we don't often... I think especially in our go busy world, a lot of activity, which is not bad, it's not bad, but we just don't often then want to pause and wonder what's going on underneath all that activity. Matter of fact, I texted a friend of mine recently, very simple, how you doing? And he said, well, I'm doing great because I'm not thinking about how I'm doing. And I thought, that's kind of how I can feel at times too. Like as long as I don't think about how I'm doing and what's going on down here, I'm okay. Um, And uh, it reminded me of about four or five years ago, I had a more serious wreck and it was a serious wreck. My car was totaled. And I remember, uh, like, like that day, you and Laura came to check on me and see how I was doing. And I was literally like, I'm great. I'm fine. I'm, no problems. No pain. I'm good. Um, and about a week later, I was at a birthday party. And um, people were making me laugh. And I was coughing a lot with allergies. And I thought my insides were going to explode. And I was in so much pain. And all of a sudden, I was like, wait a minute. Do I have, like, internal bleeding or something from this wreck? And I got with the doctor. And he said, no. You just had a lot of adrenaline coursing through your veins, and now that adrenaline has worn off, and you are feeling what happened instantaneously in your wreck. It, you were bruised all on the inside. You just didn't feel it. And I think that for all of us, especially the last few years, but all of us, life just chips and chips and chips and bangs and bangs and bangs. And for some, there's even more traumatic elements that happen or tragedy. And our adrenaline, especially... If, if things are, if, even if there's good things that are going on and great stuff, it can carry you. But if that adrenaline wears off, you're stuck having to deal with the the stuff on the on the very um, un- underbelly of that. And so for me, when I could actually be with myself, I, I was like, oh, I have some grief I've not attended to. I have some anxiety that I didn't actually term as that because I didn't think of myself being anxious. But I'm like, that's actually anxiety. I've got some doubts about God that I would have rather not admit. And so it was really getting the grace to kind of do that, that deeper dig. And, and guys, that, I'm just going to be honest, that wasn't easy. I mean, Jimmy and I talk about this all the time. Just because we're pastors, we are not immune from the toll that life takes on us. And so, you know, as I've told you, Jimmy, it was at that point that I had a decision to make. Like, um, because I believe that we were made for comfort, but that we will settle for relief. Mm. Like, God made us he made us to be comforted by his spirit and to meet him at a deep soul level. But with the intensity of life, we'll just settle for relief and we'll medicate with activity or entertainment, which are wonderful things, but taken to extremes can be hard things or just kind of distract us with activity. And so for me, I had to decide, am I going to do this courageous soul work? Am I going to dig down deep um, or am I not? And so, um, yeah, it was a beautiful invitation from God. Again, not always easy. I mean, he, he, I think I saw some places where, places where I would have, um, yeah, I would have gone there. Like even in our preaching, a lot of times I'm preaching about a topic on Sunday. And if I'm honest, I don't know how current I am with the revelation of that topic. Right. 
And we, and we always feel this way, yeah. which is why I always say, thank God I'm a preacher. Because I spent all week going, Lord, I need to be aligned with the word me. of God. Right, do this yes. in me because I can't get up there and tell you all to do something that I'm not living. And I try to be vulnerable when I'm not. But you can only do that so much before you start to feel like you're a split soul. You're saying something that you don't really believe. Mm. And, and you believe it mentally. You believe it in the mind. But the question is, do you have revelation about it in the gut? Mm-hmm. You know? So we all know God loves us, you know? Or you wouldn't come to church today without that novel thought that we serve a God that is the only God that is loving towards us. But, but then when you get rocked by suffering, you start to go, are you really good, God? Mm-hmm. I mean, like one of the things I asked God one day was, you left your people in slavery for 400 years. Mm. In between our Old Testament and New Testament, you didn't speak to people for 400 years. 400 years of silence. So how can you be good, you know? And, and uh, you know, I feel like as, as a dad, if I just like raise my voice a little bit, I feel bad, but then I come back and repent. You were okay with 400 years, so can you be good? And then when you do undertake different sufferings and, and, and very traumatic events, it makes you go, do I believe that he is good at the soul level? And so not talking about it maybe give me grace to just do dig, deeper digging in it. And, uh, and I'm grateful for that, but it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't easy, you know. So let me, where'd you land with that one? Um, well, I would say I'm still, honestly, I'm still kind of pa- unpacking. I'm going through the scripture, looking at different places. Um, I believe that where I landed is that God never promised us rescue. He promised us resurrection. Mm. And so he is not always rescuing me. And if I'm honest, I mean, I mean a lot of the scriptures I personally love are the woman who reached out for the hem of his garment right. and was healed instantaneously. Yeah. Well, what if I'm reaching out for the hem of his garment and I'm not healed instantaneously? Mm-hmm. It becomes hard to read that, and then it becomes hard to go to church and sing a song about one more time around the wall and it'll fall. Mm-hmm. But the wall's not falling, you know? And again, it, it just more, I began to just, I, I really studied the life of Joseph some, and I just was going, I began to see that all these different places where he'd, he'd peak for a moment and then he hit a hard valley. And the scripture always says, and the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. When I get to heaven, though, I'm going to ask Joseph, did you feel like the Lord was with you? (laughs) And I have a gut. He's going to be like, no, I went to prison. I did not feel he was with me. And, uh, but man, and what was the purpose? The purpose of Joseph's Mm, life. Was it to be the second in command in Egypt? Was it to be Mm. back in his people's world with a a multicolored coat? Um, But we see his resurrection, even with his family, the redemption of what happened with his family. And he tells his brothers when they are in that place, he looks at them and he says, "Um, don't hold this against you, for God brought me here. Yes. That there might be greater redemption for all. He saw his purpose in the resurrection at the end. So uh, where I landed there in the end is that he doesn't always rescue me out, but he'll redeem me out. And so in the process, feeling like anguish, you know, I... I told the last service this verse that's meant a lot to me is Galatians 4.19, where Paul said, my dear beloved children, I'm in the anguish of childbirth for you so that Christ might be formed in you. And uh, pretty bold for a man to say he's going through childbirth, you know. I'm sure there were a few women that would be like, you don't get to use that analogy. Um, That means something to a woman who has borne that weight. But he was doing the best he could to say, childbirth is not my goal. Anguish is not my goal. I'm not trying to put more on me and say, aren't a spiritual person because I'm doing all these things. He was saying, the goal is that Christ might be formed so that when people see me, I'm not like trying really hard to be a good guy or for you to be moral. We're not trying to get you to be better people for coming here today. It's more like we want you, Christ formed in us so that it just... One day, it becomes just effortlessly mm. that it exudes out of us. And so that's been a lot of what I've lived. Beautiful, powerful stuff. We had, uh, and in a weird way, it's an answer to a prayer that we have both prayed uh, in 2020 yeah. and 2021. Those were, those were tough years, right? Yeah, not, and, not easy. Uh, and Carl and I, we did one podcast together after one of those uh, Sunday people-less uh, deals that we did into <laughs> oh. a camera. Right, and uh, we went up and did a podcast, and <clears throat> we talked about that scripture where uh, Paul said, "I want to know you in the power of your resurrection, right, the hem of the garment for healing, but I also want to know you in the fellowship of your sufferings." And one of the things that we both said in that podcast, we said, "You know, whatever we want to do, coming out of twenty 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 one, we want to be more like Jesus." 
Uh, don't know if you want to pray that prayer. Uh, yeah. you know, because more like Jesus means death to self. Exactly right. So the sweetness of God, right? We have this uh, death in us so yeah. that life might go through us. Right. And, um, and that is the gospel, right? Death, burial, and resurrection, if the goal's clear. Yeah. And, um, and, I, and I know that is for you. And <sighs> Absolutely. It's our desire. And I you just want to be like Jesus. You don't know all that would take. I don't think that any of us would really sign up for all Jesus has if he said, no, beforehand, I'm going to show you behind door number three everything you're going to go through. Yeah. You know, he's just so kind that he just kind of brings us bit by bit, reveals his glory enough for us to to take that on. And, and for someone like myself, I don't know if y'all are this way, I can be really hard on myself. I'm a one on the Enneagram, so I'm a little bit more like, we got to get this together, you know? And so I can kind of beat myself up. So I think that even in praying to be like Jesus, I did the same prayer this year. I think I was just more gracious to myself. I would always pray, Lord, give me, I want to be kind to myself today, Lord, but I still want to do the deeper dig yeah. to be more like you. Yes. And so I had a little you know, you know, I, I said, Jesus, I want to be more like you, but remember, I'm a weak man. <laughs> be merciful to me. Yeah. I'm not that yeah. tough, Lord. Mer- I am, I'm a oh, tender man. man. Yeah, exactly. Please be exactly. merciful in your work. I want to be like you, but through me. Yeah. yes. <laughs> mercy, 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 mercy. Yeah. So we talked about another big lesson um, just on the identity stuff was a little mm-hmm. surprising. Yeah. And probably not really surprising to God, uh, but or to us in the long haul. But what did God do through that? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that when I was in, so when I was in the college years, I gave myself to knowing who I am in Christ. It was one of my key pieces. I see Margie Atwood here today, and she was just sat under her and Daryl's teaching and others, and that rocked my life. It's actually one of my favorite messages to preach to people because it so changed me. So if you would have told me during your sabbatical what God's going to deal with is identity, I would have been like, huh, that's strange. I feel like I've kind of been there, done that, and got Margie's t-shirt. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of good there, you know. Um, but I actually reached out to a Jewish rabbi here in town and asked if he would mentor me a little bit over the sabbatical. And we met. He was like, I've never had a Christian pastor ask this. What's going on? And I said, well, you know, you and I both read the, the Ten Commandments, but as Christians, we're really good about nine of those. But that whole Sabbath thing, we don't quite get. So would you help me? What does that mean to, to, to do Sabbath and live with Sabbath? And I just appreciated him so much. He's just such a humble man. He wasn't arrogant at all. He was actually just more grieved. He was like, oh, how have you lived your life? I want you to experience what my people experience. And he would often talk about Sabbath, but then he would always, he'd greet me always with the Jewish greeting. He'd be like, oh, shalom, Carl, peace be to you. And I'd be like, and to you, you know, like I was like, I, I, I don't know what to do. And I didn't, I, I didn't want to say the wrong thing to him. And I was even like, don't say Jesus, don't say Jesus. But, you know, like, God bless you. Is that okay? You know, like, and, uh, he was always like, Carl, I don't care. We, we you know, we're, we're fine here. But as he, I, he started to unpack shalom for me. And I always knew what shalom meant in the sense of peace. And last week, when we started the Names of God series, uh, Weston talked about the name Jehovah, the I am. And then there's all these statements that we'll unpack some this summer. And, but the Jehovah Shalom I knew was peace. But my rabbi, my rabbi, my rabbi <laughs> friend helped me see that he was like, it's not just peace, it's wholeness. Mm-hmm. To the Jewish people, it meant where everything about your mind, your soul, your body, your spirit all came into alignment mm. under God's leadership for a wholeness that you were made for that you don't always taste. And so for me, I began to realize there's what is rocking the the wholeness, that shalom. And I would, I realized it's really going to typically be a wound or a lie. And the lies that I evaluated that I think most of us all face are, I am what I have, I am what I do, and I am what others say about me. And again, I wouldn't those lies one more time. I am what I have. Okay. I am what I do. And I am what others say about me. Now, again, I know those aren't true, but if I'm honest, I began to realize that there's some, there's some places that I, I believe that those things are not true, but I actually live in them as if they are true. So um, because I'm a doer, I'm a, I'm a preacher, I'm a speaker, I'm a leader, I'm a crisis averter, I'm a, a discipler, and I'm a dad, and I'm a husband, and there's just a lot of roles as, that I hold. And then a sabbatical, it was kind of like I'm an iPhone plug with all these charges things going out and someone started unplugging all of those and now I don't have that anymore. 
And I was a little bit like, who am I? And so, and even reevaluating th- some of the hard things I go through in life. Like for me, preaching is part of what I do. And so as preachers, you, you, you walk out every Sunday. Your buddy had that quote one day, like, what was it like? I walked out of church today and I didn't want to shoot myself. I felt it was a great sermon. It was a great you know sermon. what I mean? You know, and yeah, sometimes we exactly. can feel that way as preachers. We carry your transformation on our shoulders yes. through our words. Right. And you don't feel that way. You're like, hey, that was great. Or not. Don't tell anybody we forgot, but it was great. <laughs> well, I don't know what you talked about. You, know, you don't feel that way, but we can carry it. Or if someone even leaves our church and they're mad because of something I did, I want to love people well. I don't want our systems to be in place so people don't do that. But then when it happens, you can just be like, I am what I do. I am what I do. And I'm not doing great. I spoke to so many friends that I met through this journey, meeting so many people, especially in their 40s and 50s, of all walks of life, who talked about the last few years, things just tanking. And it could be as simple as, my kids aren't doing well. My, their grades aren't going well. My business isn't doing well. My song career's not going well. And we don't know, mean to, but what, something inside of us is going, I am what I do. I am what I do. And it, it's taking a toll. And so I think that what God began to do in me was this work of abandoning the outcome to him. Mm. And that, I, I, I know we say stuff like that, but it, it had to get down deep in me. I'd start many days. I abandon the outcome to you, God. I'm going to give my best, but I'm going to abandon the outcome to you. And so I began to, as I began to pray that, I believe God just started doing a real liberating work in me where I was like, I'm going to keep working hard, but my ego is no longer going to be tied to how this message went or how that leaders meeting went or how my child is doing at this moment. Um, And again, that's a process. It's not like, oh good, he's back and God fixed all that stuff. You know, it's a little bit more like, like Paul said, my dear children, I feel like a child again. I feel like he reinvented me. I'm just starting this journey. It's a brand new journey. It's not a, he's completed. It's more like, here's a new operating system for us to walk in. So I'm excited about walking in and more about who I'm becoming as opposed to being obsessed about what I'm doing. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's powerful stuff. A lot more there than most people know. <laughs> yeah. Thank you yeah. for yeah. doing the hard work. And I, even as I'm yeah. saying it now, it might come off in little quotes or linear. It, it kind of looked like this on the sabbatical, you know, but I'm, hopefully it's powerful. I want to be honest and vulnerable with you as my family. So, yeah. Well, speaking of family, so, um, of course, the questions are, so uh, as Carl reenters the family and serves all of us as a pastor here in our midst, what does that look like in these coming days? And we'll give you a couple of frameworks. One is, um, you know, the beauty of Antioch is it's not just local. um, It is also national and international. We have about 100 places where we are planting churches and have teams around the world. And so uh, we often call it the Antioch Movement. And all movements kind of have three core things. They have a theology, they have a mission, and they have relationships. And sometimes people build build movements around one or the other. They build it just around theology. And then if you don't follow that theology, well, then you're not a part of that movement. Or just a mission. If you don't follow that exact mission, it doesn't work. Or relationships. And our uh, desire, actually our calling, has been to do all three. Theologically, how do we align rightly with the Word of God? Mission-wise, how do we stay on purpose to rescue men and women for the glory of God? And then relationally, no matter what, we're going to hang together. And um, and for that, I'm grateful, Mm -hmm. right? We are in this together Mm -hmm. until Jesus comes. And so that relationship has carried us uh, in the journeys of mission and theology, and that's, that's who we are, that's who Carl is, that's who I am, uh, and that's who we want to be together. Uh, then, and maybe another little framework is that for us, you know, we have a lot of pastors around here. We are just one big team of a lot of incredible people. I, I, hopefully you've gotten a chance to meet different ones of our staff and pastors, and mm-hmm. we always feel like the richest people in the world. We walk yeah, into a yeah. room, we're like, wow, we are wealthy people just out of the people that we have on our staff to serve. And obviously Carl is a central part of our uh, pastoral team. And one of the things that we've all said all along the way is, hey, every year we've said, Lord, where do I fit best? Whatever gift I can give, I, I'm here to just honor you, serve people. And so here's a few ways that Carl will be serving in these coming days. Uh, number one, he'll be an elder in our midst. He already is. Uh, he and Blair have carried us from the beginning, and Carl will continue to serve as an elder, which is our governance and serving our community. 
Uh, Carl will continue to serve on our strategy team, which is if you were to have our elders kind of as oversight, the strategy team is what leads our staff, drives our staff. Carl's a central part of that team with us. And maybe a unique piece, and it's really not that unique because you've always done this, but <clears throat> is that we are charging Carl in these next few months on all of our behalf to connect with you. You know, 2020 and 2021 still lingers with a bit of a tail to it where people still feel disconnected, uh, still wonder, where do I fit? How do I connect to what is currently going on? And for us, that would be in Antioch and how are we serving here in our community around the world? And the need to get in small groups, to have 100 coffees, to sit down and talk with people, maybe questions that you've had uh, through the years. Uh, I can say this of of Carl and uh, of Blair is they represent us and they're able to speak on our behalf uh, as a community. And so we're asking Carl to connect us, reconnect us here in our city and, uh, and to connect with you. So you will be, uh, there won't just be random sightings on ESPN. You will see Carl <laughs> live in your house and gathering people uh, face-to-face and, uh, and house-to-house a part of that. And Carl, why don't you just comment on that, your heart for the church right now, what, what your heart to connect everybody to what God's doing. Yeah, I thought a lot about the church while I was away on my sabbatical. And, um, you know, one of the things I do is I travel to a lot of our U.S. churches, and I, they, they ask me to talk about authority and how relationships work in families and churches. And, and I always quote Hebrews 13, 17 as a sobering reminder to us in the church where it says, obey your leaders and submit to them. And those are very big words. And it, it says that, that they might do their job with joy and that it would, you know, not be troublesome to them. And then I always say that and say, let that kind of be a sobering reality that that's the, that's the, there's some, there's some of that that happens in families and churches, et cetera. Well, I read that verse in the last month and realized there was this whole portion right in the middle that I had never really seen before. It says, for they are keeping watch over your souls Mm. as those who will give an account. Wow. Man, it just really I could not get, they are keeping watch over your souls. And I think in the past, I'd kind of, just kind of flip through that a little bit like, because they don't want you to go to hell. They want you to go to heaven, you know? And as I read that, I was like, that's not what the writer of Hebrews is saying there. He's, there's actually like an accountability on, do these, are these people walking with a more full and whole, like I talked about, soul? You know, as even as our, the intensity of our, our times and our lives um, increases, Really, are we getting what we need at the soul level? So I, I kind of saw it like a new job description. Like when I'm sending you back in, Carl, is the soul keeper, if you will. Like you'll be held accountable for the souls of the people. And so a lot of what I have is just a fresh compassion, I think, for all of us who have taken a real hit the last few years uh, or have just a fresh desire for God and our families and our, and our churches and our city, but just feel a lot of the miss. So a lot of that is... My heart is to get people where they feel full on the inside and connected to what we're doing as a church and in this amazing city. Those are a few thoughts. Great. Hey, before I turn it over to you, just a couple other things that, well, of course, we, we've talked about this, but that Carl will be doing. He'll be a teacher in our midst, as you guys have always enjoyed. I've enjoyed one of my favorite teachers in the world. And uh, this summer, we've got several of other pastors leading. Carl will be back up in mid-August, and uh, he will be a part of our teaching team, of course. Uh, then also he'll be discipling and mentoring, which again, he's always done that. But uniquely, these things that God's been doing in you is also a gift to our extended um, uh, movement around the world. So Carl will be investing a little bit more in some of our U.S. pastors and some of our international workers as well. So our gift to the body is back, and uh, we are so honored and so blessed. And uh, and maybe I, I want to uh, say one last thing here is uh, the scripture that comes to mind is uh, out of James. It says, uh, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Mm-hmm. Thank you for humbling yourself to God, mm-hmm. first and foremost, mm-hmm. to all of us, mm-hmm. to me personally. Yeah. Thank you for the humility mm-hmm. that always produces grace. Mm-hmm. Thanks, man. And we're going to get the grace that he promised us. Yeah, amen. amen. Thank you. Love, love you, buddy. You. Appreciate love you. Love you, love you, buddy. Appreciate you I'm going to turn it over to Carl. He's got one last word for us. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I, uh, uh, I found myself on my sabbatical looking at verses that I've read thousands of times and 
and wondering, do I really know what those verses mean? And uh, one of those verses I came across, if you're on a sabbatical, you've got to read Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. You can't, you can't do Sabbath without reading this, this verse. And I know that you know it. I can just say the first few words and you know it. Come to me. All who are weary and are burdened, and I'll give you rest. Now, this is actually a, a verse you can, as a pastor, keep this in your back pocket. If your sermon just is tanking, just read it. And the whole room will be like, yes, yes. <laughs> You'll hear the, mmm, you know, like this is kind of one of those cheat verses, if you're, I'm really honest, you know. But I began to ask the question, do I really live in it? When he said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle I'm humble in heart. This is what separates him from other gods. He's gentle and humble in heart. What do you say? You're going to find rest for your souls. Like we've been talking about, that deep, deep place. He says, for my yoke is easy. My burden is light. And I think that this would have meant a lot to the people that day, especially as an agricultural people, because he's speaking to them and he's just going, are y'all wiped out? by the religion of your day? Are you so tired of feeling like I'm a spiritual loser because I don't pray as much or read as much or do as much or know as much and don't even really still know what a sabbatical is? I guess real spiritual people do that or Sabbath or, you know, like I just, are you kind of tired of not measuring up? And are you, because you're feeling like you got to push it to the finish line and we got to get this. It's on my back and not just spiritually, but also in my family and in my job and I just push and push and push. So it's interesting that Jesus flips the script. And he goes, I want you to know rest in your soul. So I'm going to give you a work tool. Isn't that weird? To get rest, I'm going to give you a work tool. But the work tool is a tool, a yoke, that's going to fit over one oxen and another. And instead of pushing, they're going to pull together. And now there's going to be a weight distribution that is right, you would never put like an ox and a deer together. Or that ox would just pull the deer and be like working hard. But that's a lot of times what we we do. We're like, I want to keep up with God or God, I'll get this and I'll take off and I'll do it. And we're running around and the weight is not distributed, just distributed rightly. So Jesus is saying, come to me because what you, you want is you, you think you want relief. You think you want to feel better. You want some peace. You want a feeling. But I am that peace. So come to me, and then let's pull this together. And I, I, I honestly, I thought about this prayer that I had seen in a book, and I prayed a lot even as a young, zealous leader. And it was just like this charge that said, let's pray like it all depends on God and live as if it all depends on us. And I found myself reading, thinking about that, and I was like, that is bull. That's not in the Bible. He never said, I want you to pray hard and then just strap it on your back and push it across the finish line. He actually intended to want to do this with us. And so I, I, I went back and I read before that in Matthew eleven twenty five, 25, it says, Jesus was speaking to the crowd and he, he prays and he says, I thank you, heavenly father. You've kept all this from the wise and learned, meaning the, the religious people who think they're all got everything in a row You've kept all these from them and you're reserving it for the little children. And isn't that beautiful? He, for all of us who are like, good, because I don't feel like a scholar. I don't feel like the ninja Christian who just has really been soaring at all levels in every area. He's like, good. I, I, that's not what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for the little child who goes, I actually don't know what I'm doing, but I just would like to be with you. And he says, well, take this yoke on me, on you, but it's going to be connected to me. And then there's going to be a weight distribution that pulls this together. So you're going to pull your family. You're going to work with me. You're going to see this as a, as a we thing. And so even just right now, I just encourage you to to stand to your feet and and open your hands because I, I want this What I don't want is I don't want this to be the kumbaya moment that you're like, by the time you get to the kids' ministry, it's gone, you know? Um, And God bless the kids' ministry. And hopefully you all will go work in the kids' ministry and bring them some Jehovah Shalom. But, But I really mean that sometimes what we have to do to get to that rest, it's not always easy. Actually, there's a weird verse in the Bible that says, strive to enter into my rest. 
I, I've always hated that verse. Like, really work hard to feel peaceful. It doesn't make sense. But you understand when you get into this, especially when you feel like you feel like there's been some corrosion that's built up inside of you for whatever reason, you'll have this sense like, I don't really know how to get to that peace. And I love what Dallas Willard says. He says, grace is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. It's opposed to doing something so that I feel like I get to go up a notch with God or in front of the church or people. But instead, there will be some effort, but the effort is to actually step into his rest and then find the comfort our soul longs for. And so as, I, as you have your hands open, whether you're in this room or you're following along with us from home, I just want to encourage us that, to even maybe identify where is something you feel like you're pushing right now? Maybe it's like you and a kid, like they're just not getting it. Maybe it's hiring at work. You know, there's just some pressure on you and you're like, I am doing my best. Maybe it's even in your walk with God, you feel like you can't get over something and you're just like, what the heck? What's that for you? I just invite you, almost like you had those in your hand. I want you to abandon that outcome to God and just open your hand to God. Meaning, a lot of times a golfer will hit the ball and then like start kind of willing it to go a certain direction with his body. But instead, God just inviting you, give it to me right now because there's, you can't will it there. You have to give it to me and let me pull with you to get there. And Jesus was on the cross carrying all the weight of the world more than we'll ever know. And he said, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And so I just encourage you right now maybe to just pray that very simply, into your hands. I commit my life. Some of you are doing this for the first time. You never even walked with Jesus, but you're turning from your old life right now and you're saying, into your hands, I commit my life. You might even just breathe in, just into your hands and then breathe it out. I commit my grief into your hands. I commit my family into your hands commit the future that I don't know what to do with into your hands I commit our country into your hands I commit my spirit we thank you Lord for being our good shepherd and this morning we, we enter into this yoke of rest with you thanking you that you've, you're taking some of the weight off of us that can be distributed May there be grace, even all day long, little reminders all throughout the day to just pray that little prayer into your hands. We commit our spirit. And as we do, may we find the soul, comfort, and rest you promised. In Jesus' name. Let's go to the shepherd now.